over the last 13 years, I've been documenting our natural world with a project called Day to Night. I stand in a, usually a crane for sometimes 12 to 36 hours, capturing light, humanity, and our natural world from a single point of view. I then take, on average, about 50 of those moments and merge them into a single photograph. This is this recent 2021 inauguration of Joe Biden. And as you look closely, if you look to the right, you can actually see the helicopter of our former president leaving uh, during the dark clouds. And in midday, you see that's the actual inauguration going on. And then at sunset in the evening, the memorial lights for the COVID victims light. This project really started for me in New York City. I have a love affair with my city and I wanted to create images that nobody had ever seen before. But photographs that really reflected my collective memory of, of what I think New York is. The work started to reflect history. Uh, this is on 2010, and I was able to capture uh, on 9-11 on Fifth Avenue, the memorial lights of the World Trade Center uh, on that fateful day of 9-11. And so for me, it was a picture to speak to the idea that, you know, as New Yorkers, we have moved forward, but we never forget one of the greatest snowstorms I've ever seen in New York City in Central Park, Times Square. And through this work, I began to see that these pictures were telling a different story in a way that conventional photography doesn't. Uh, I'm merging time and many, many moments, and I started to realize there were so many different stories that I could tell within this process. This picture, for example, is now history. There are no cabs like this on, in, in New York City. Uh, you know, there's mostly Ubers. I then shot the Brooklyn Bridge, and I think the exciting part of my work is when you get close to it. My work is really about looking and seeing, and I like to describe it all the time as I'm, I'm basically a street photographer shooting from 40 feet in the air. There's nothing planned about what I do. I'm essentially reacting to what's in front of me. I work in the most traditional manner as a still photographer. So my work pivoted at this point. I had been focused on cities, and landscapes, and suddenly I got an opportunity with National Geographic to use my process day to night and document uh, for the 100th anniversary of our national parks. This was the 2016 cover of the magazine. I shot Yosemite, and it was upon making this photograph that I realized that I could tell a story about some of the things that I was feeling and that we're all feeling about the changes in our environment. We then traveled to the Grand Canyon, where I shot from the top of the desert tower for 36 hours to capture this image. And then a major change happened, and that was the introduction of wildlife in my photography. I traveled to the Serengeti with the hope of trying to capture the great migration day to night. And I got there and I, was, um, I found an extraordinary watering hole. It turned out that there was a five week drought that was going on. And so the animals were all gravitating to this one watering hole. I spent 26 hours in the blind you see here, but what I witnessed was nothing short of really biblical. Uh, to see wildlife as I studied them over the course of 26 hours, competitive species share a resource that's more valuable than gold these days, water, was something I just wasn't prepared for. I watched as these competitive species shared this unique resource. And in a way, I began to see a new consciousness that wildlife and the planet seemed to be connected in a way. And it was through day to night that I discovered that I could tell a story about this and maybe share it with you all. So that really defined a purpose for me in my work. And although I'm curious, purpose is what really drives my photography. I then traveled to Lake Begoria where I wanted to photograph bird migration of the lesser flamingos. These birds are very, very difficult to photograph. In fact, in Lake Begoria in Kenya, where I was, they do not nest. So for me to situate a blind and sit there for 36 hours became an ultimate challenge. But these birds actually love fresh water. And it turned out that climate change actually helped me on this picture. Because as you look at this scene, you're gonna see these hills are green. That's because it was raining every night. We got a thunderstorm 
at 9.30 at night. But in the dead of dry season, that's normally not supposed to happen. But because of that rain, the foreground gave me a beautiful fresh water stream and the flamingos ignored me. And those birds in the foreground that you saw, those are what are called marabou storks. And those guys attack the flamingos every hour on the hour. So this center picture is one frame when the birds in the front and the, and the marabou storks in the back converged on all of the lesser flamingos. So part about my work is that I'm telling the story of how these animals exist and how they live within our environment. I then traveled to one of the remote places, a very, very small island off the coast of Argentina in the Falkland chain called Steeple Jason. It's here where I was photographing the black-browed albatross. These birds are incredible. They mate 50 years for life. And there I am in the thick of it. And I spent 36 hours in this tussock, that's the high grass you see, capturing the beautiful, beautiful majesty of this species. Stephen, are you freaking out? Yeah. People often ask me, did that rainbow really happen in your photograph? And so my assistant took out his phone and decided, I, I got to prove to everybody these things really happened for you. But it was all worth the energy and worth the time because this is what we ended up with. And the incredible thing, I think, for me is I describe my work as a merger between art and science. I get to study the mating ritual of a species. I see a mother teaching a baby how to fly. And all of that stuff only happens because I'm looking for hours upon hours at a scene. And what I do is almost like a meditative study, but things unfold in front of me that even scientists don't get to see. I then traveled to Nebraska where I had heard about one of the great migrations of the Sandhill Cranes. And along the Platte River, I was able to build a blind and I stayed in it for 36 hours, capturing this absolutely extraordinary species. Here they are asleep, they get up in the morning and they're flying to roost. They end up going to fields and most of the local people in Nebraska actually till their fields. And that feeds these birds, they don't hunt them, they feed them. And the reason they don't hunt them is because the Sandhill Cranes in Nebraska have become the most popular tourist destination. I then headed north where I started a new project. Canada being so close by, I was interested in, could I tell the story of species and habitat, the endangered species and habitat that's going on right next door to us? So I traveled to a place called Ropes and Bite. And this is the only place in the world where orca whales come for a spa treatment. They literally have rocks in the bite that don't exist anywhere else in the world. That these orcas, the families come in and they do these body rubbings against the rocks. And it's a unique place because you have cruise ships, you have fishing boats, you have kayakers, bald eagles, every known species imaginable, all sharing one place. And yet it works. It's a perfect harmony, a balance. And for me, it was an inspirational thing to see that we can achieve this kind of harmony in a way. I then traveled to Churchill, Manitoba, Hudson Bay, where I documented these polar bears. And, you know, ice is changing. It's, it's dramatically changing as our climate has warmed. And I remember getting there that one day and seeing for the first time that these bears could not cross because the ice wasn't cold enough. I then created a photograph of Greenland. In 2019, on July, I went for a photograph of what I thought was gonna depict rising seas. I was watching the melt of these great icebergs. What I witnessed over the course of 36 hours of photographing was a feast by humpback whales. And these whales literally were gorging themselves on krill. And the reason they were gorging themselves was because we're, when the day I was photographing turned out to be one of the largest melts in recorded history in Greenland. It was 198 billion tons of ice liquefied in the month of July. When you liquefy glacial ice, sediment is released. And that sediment exploded the plankton. And when the plankton explode, 
the krill explode to eat the plankton. And that's why the humpback whales, the plentiful humpback whales in this photograph were gorging themselves. And it was an aha moment for me because I thought the real story about melting glaciers was sea level rise. But what I realized was it's actually the fact that the starting point, the top down point of our food chain in the oceans starts with ice. So without ice, how do we feed our oceans? America the Beautiful is a new series I just did for National Geographic. They commissioned me to go across America and capture four of some of the most important places that need to be protected by 2030 for the 30 by 30 initiative, which is to protect, you know, 30% of our land and sea. The first place I went was a place called Shai Shai Beach. It's part of Olympic National Park and it's run by the Macaw tribe. This is the point of arches. I stood for almost 22 hours on those rocks and witnessed these spectacular sea stacks as the tide changed. It took eight miles of hiking to get in there, about three and a half hours. So it was a huge effort, but the photograph was worth it. You can actually see the tides change in my photograph. I then went to Bears Ears National Park. It's actually a national monument. It's not a, a national park yet. And at Bears Ears, you can see we hiked in over an hour and I slept three days on a spot that's called the Citadel. And we had 50 mile an hour winds for the entire shoot day. <laughs> As you can hear my assistant screaming, with 80 pounds of sandbags, it was still difficult to keep everything still. But again, the effort was worth it. This is a magical place, a place where a former president had actually wanted to create a lithium mine. And thankfully, it's protected now. It is such an important part of Navajo culture. And for me to be able to photograph it was just really spiritual, especially the fact that I made this picture on a day that happens only once every 33 years, where Easter, Ramadan, and Passover all align on the same day. And the planetary alignment in the month of April allowed us to have Jupiter, Venus, Mars, and Saturn and a full moon in the same picture. So it became the cover of the Geographic in the September issue this year. And through this process of creating these photographs, I've really elevated my own consciousness. I'm trying to see the world in a new way. And day to night has truly taken me to the far reaches of our planet. My mission is to capture the epic beauty and wonder of our natural world, showing how wildlife and habitat are truly interconnected. Seeing in a new way enables thinking in a new way. And through the act of looking and really seeing, we begin to feel. And that's what I hope my work does for people, is it inspires you to feel. Time will not wait for us. We can't afford to wait another day or night. Thank you.